muted there, Z? You got me? Oh, am I okay now? Hello, everyone. This is Lavalet from the Lavalet and Ella Live Show, starting back over one more time. Uh, I'm hosting the show this afternoon. Uh, my co-host, Miss Ella Isaac, is uh, stuck on the freeway somewhere with a flat tire. So hopefully she'll make it into the show before the show is over. Uh, she got caught up on the flat tire episode. But uh, today I have a special guest in the house with me today. I'm going to have Mr. Larry Puncho Brown on in a minute. And we're going to talk about his book for a little while. So I just want to start off by saying hello to everyone who's already in the house. Especially, first of all, I'm going to say hello to my friend out west, way west. And that's Fern, who's coming to me from Cali. Hey, Fern. And then I see my other friend from West Texas or Central Texas, should I say, Miss Robin Fuller from Midland, Texas. All right. So I don't know it's hot out there. So I know she's in the house with the air conditioner running up and watching the show, taking it easy. Uh, if that's what everybody should be doing because there's heat just everywhere. So I, I know it's hot here. So it has to be hot where you are too. Uh, all right, so come on, give me, so if you're in the house, give us a shout out, let us know you're here. Uh, like I say, today we have uh, Mr. Larry Pancho Brown on the show with us. We're going to talk about his book, his, his um, retrospective book. Yes, Robin, it's hot out there. You are correct. <laughs> All right, come on, everybody, give me some help. Uh, let me hear from you. Ifatola, all right. Hey, Bam family, all right. There we go. I hope I said that right. All right, and Abu's in the house. Philly's here. Where are my New Orleans people? Has got no New Orleans in the house nowhere yet? Come on now. You got Philly, got Midland, got Cali. All right, so I, uh, maybe it's a slow day, everybody just getting started, you know, for the weekend, getting ready. Gonna be a hot one. <laughs> oh, there my friend Cynthia from Detroit. Great, Cynthia, how you doing today? Is it warm in Detroit? And tell me a little bit about the festival. Did you go out? Was it any good? Let me hear from you. Oh, that's my number one fan, Kali. Ah, I now I know who that is. That's my New Jersey, Philly, uh, Pennsylvania family. All right. <laughs> All right. Hi there in Baltimore, too, says Mr. Larry Pancho Brown. It's hot everywhere. All right. Yana, Samson, all right. Great to have you in the house. Consistency, is that right? I've uh, been there. That's in Florida, right outside of Orlando, I think, right where Disneyland starts. So welcome to, oh, I see D. Lindsay from New Orleans. I didn't see that. That skipped up on me, okay? So glad to have you in the house also. All right. At Wina Sala from Nashville, we haven't had you in the house before. Glad to have you in here from Nashville. Uh, oh, you were. You were in our last show, I think. You came on and you and you let us know that you were from Nashville. And I said I've never done a show in Nashville, but I know that there is a Black Arts show that's put on there every year. I don't remember the name of it. Oh, wow, Cynthia, 90 degrees in Baltimore. That's warm. <laughs> okay, all right. She said she didn't go to the festival, but there were a lot of vendors and she heard it was nice, so that's great. Um, it's nice for them to be down on the river and in Hearts Plaza, but it's a shame that you have to pay $15 to go in. So I hope that the entertainment was worth the $15 that they charge for the uh, 
entrance fee into it, you know. Um, so, hello everybody. <laughs> All right, so we're getting on into the show. And um, I don't get any more uh, hellos. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start my show off because uh, Ella isn't here. She got caught up in the traffic thing with a flat tire. So I'm waiting for her. Maybe she might make it. Um, all right. So Kibby. All right. From Baltimore. Also. Oh, we got the Baltimore people in the house because we got Larry Pancho Brown in the house this afternoon. That's and Baltimore is going to show out. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in talking about this brother this afternoon because he's lived his whole life in Baltimore. I don't, I don't know if he's lived any other place other than Baltimore. So he's definitely been a staple of the Baltimore community for a long, long time. So that's going to be one of my questions to him this afternoon. I don't know if he's ever actually lived in another city outside of Baltimore. I think, I mean, you know, he may have, I know he goes to other places, goes to lots of other places, but actually living in another city, I'm going to have to check with him on that aspect of uh, his book since it's all about Baltimore. All right. So it's hot everywhere and uh, we all trying to beat the heat. Uh, air conditioning is going up in the roof. The money is being spent, being blown out of the ceiling. All, all in the act of trying to keep cool. And it's very necessary because you don't want to overheat. Overheating is not a good thing. Um, so stay cool, everybody. Don't, don't worry about the bill. We'll take care of that later on. <laughs> All right. So I guess it's, uh, let me see what my time's going on here. Uh, I got three more minutes before I bring in my guests. So if you got something that you, uh, give me a shout out. If you're new to uh, the Lavalier and Ella live show, or you're new to the Black Artist Marketplace, give us a shout out. Let us hear from you, okay? Oh, okay. New Orleans finally got in the house. There's Manhattis in the house. Another New Orleanian. Uh, they're experiencing a lot of rain. It's, it's warmer here than it is there. So uh, they're just getting a lot of rain down in New Orleans. So, uh, okay, Facebook user, how you doing? So who, who are you, Facebook user? Let's, let's hear from you. Give us a name. Give us a shout out. Let us know where you're staying at. Yeah, you're right, love. Electricity. Well, I hope, I really hope that we really go solar and wind and all of that good stuff. Uh, I think fossil fuels are a way of the past. And uh, I'm really all for climate change and for taking care of the, the planet. I know uh, I, uh, I don't want them to say we didn't do a very good job at that when my great grandkids are here. I hope that they have a place to stay that they can still fish and have fresh water and you know things that it, that I grew up with as a child. But I know things are changing rapidly because you know um, back in the day you had a five a five digit phone number that was really easy to remember. You only had to remember those five five digits. So now you don't even have to remember anybody's phone number at all. All you have to do is put their name in the thing and it comes up with their phone number. So you don't even have to do that anymore. So it's taking it all away from us in terms of what it is that we need to do with providing us with a lot of things that are really easy. Okay. Like the air fryer. Like, I mean, I have an air fryer now. I'm, I'm blown away by being able to just spray my fish and put it in the thing and couple of minutes later, I got a meal and it's really easy for me to wash and clean and go on about my business. So I don't spend a lot of time with the cooking thing, use standing over uh, an oven or a stove, you know, so everything is really changing and uh, life itself is really moving really, really fast. Okay, Brother Matthews, how you doing? From Silver Springs, Maryland, first time here, glad to have you here. 
and we're going to welcome you to the show. I'm glad you came in. Tonight we have a very special guest. If any of you guys haven't or are not aware of Mr. Larry Puncher Brown, I'm going to give you a little bit about him. He's from Baltimore, Maryland. And like I said, I know he's been a Baltimore native most of his life. I'm going to ask him whether or not he has lived in another city before. Uh, but uh, before as I know, he's only been in Baltimore, so, uh, and he's a staple there in Baltimore. So without saying any more, uh, and um, if you don't know very much about uh, Larry Poncho Brown's artwork, we're going to delve into it a little bit on the show. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give him a little interview. He's going to talk about his book, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So welcome to the show, Mr. Larry Poncho Brown there hey 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 Pancho. hey mr lava lay the man the myth the legend <laughs> nah brother it's you. <laughs> <laughs> you 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 are the man you are the man we're gonna be talking about your book and you got a book my brother yeah man it's uh it's crazy but yeah i have a book i am now an author yeah oh man I'm, i want to tell you brother i i had to do some reading uh i was impressed by your writing i i i i wasn't a chance i didn't have a chance to read everything that i wanted to read but i sort of skipped through it and i noticed that you were just like i mean you were the author <laughs> yeah i told I toyed around with the notion of trying to find a ghost writer. Um, but it, I, 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 one thing I wanted to try to do is that I wanted to capture my voice as much as possible. Yeah, well, that, you definitely did that one, brother. I, there's no doubt about that. Like I said, I mean, the reading is really good. I'm, I'm really going to get into the reading. I got a chance to get my book on Wednesday. I've only had a chance to visually look at it and appreciate it. And first of all, I want to tell you how how impressed I am with the quality of what you do. And and I know that you are very meticulous and 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 very concerned about detail. And there wasn't just I mean, looking at this book, it, it's it's just spot on. There's 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 <laughs> there's there's no creaks. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, that was part of the journey. I mean, this was my second book. I had an uh, opportunity to do a book for another uh, person about three years ago. And um, so that gave us a chance to do some practice. And I have a team, uh, Joe Ford, who's my art director. And I have uh, another lady named Donna Gardner, who uh, is our production person. She does all of our graphic design. I'm a graphic designer by trade, but I stay out of it. And I say I, I become the creative director with that group. And so our first book was, uh, may have seen it around, it's called Wondrous Works it's by a sister by the name of uh, Dr. Sheila Wright, which really talks about her collection. Uh, really nicely done book. Uh, she talks about all of her pieces in her collection, how she went about collecting them, anecdotes about the pieces. Uh, but she also talked about her collector's journey. Uh, so that was really our first book and the prerequisite to me doing mine. Okay, so that gave you an understanding of what was necessary for you to be able to do to put yours together. Well, again, as a graphic designer, uh, I've done many types of publications over the years. Just people uh, don't know that that's my actual background. My background is in graphic design. Uh, so I've never done anything as big as a book, but I've done plenty of catalogs and uh, exhibition catalogs and, and things like that. Uh, so, yeah, it was a venture for us to do that book because that book was a two year process. All right. So, and uh, uh, you went into your book during the pandemic. Is that about right? When you yeah. decided that you were going to um, work on that project? That well, I actually started it in 2019, just before the pandemic hit. Uh, and the pandemic, of course, brought it to a screeching halt. So right after the pandemic uh, year, I went back and I, I tried to get back into getting that book done. In addition to uh, wearing a new hat as an author, I was also wearing a new hat as a film, a filmmaker. So I've been trying to put a little time on both projects, but it, it reached a point where I felt like it was time for me to really get my book done. 
Yeah, because you got a project going with the uh, you're doing a documentary. Uh, yes. On, on some of the other artists that you know that are uh, fine art artists that are you've been. Yeah, doing. I mean it's it's just a time to tell your story, and so many stories are untold because we're not doing video, we're not doing film, we're not doing writing. And unfortunately, in the hustle and grind of us doing our craft, uh, sometimes we're so busy chasing the dollar that we don't really get a chance to tell our stories. And there was a time when other people would tell our stories. But now in this new age of Internet and things, it's actually more difficult to find someone to just write about what you're trying to do. I mean, everybody wants to do a podcast. Everybody wants to do Zoom. But there's no written written uh, information being done. So. Uh, I felt that to be a real big problem. I've had plenty of conversation with other artists, uh, especially coming through that period between 1985 and 2005, where so many of us became household names during that uh, that period of time. Uh, you know, the Leroy Campbells, the uh, Paul Goodnights, uh, <coughs> St. James's, uh, all these people uh, were uh, became rock stars in the 80s and 90s through their work because of the Cosby era effect of art being in the home. And so... Yeah, yeah. When we look at how much each one of us have invested in publishing prints, preparing our originals for, for show, um, many of us could have done 10 books by now. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, that's something I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, mm -hmm. I know your career uh, was influenced uh, back in the 80s. I, I would imagine that, that your influence were comic books and things of that nature because uh, in the in the very beginning of your book, you show a lot of the uh, of the uh, futuristic ladies <laughs> that that uh, probably were down in the doing doing the graffiti area when that oh that, yeah you know that's, that that that's whole the, thing is coming alive. All that stuff is early '80s hip hop was just coming into the mainstream. Uh, the book covers pieces from my high school years into my college years and up to today and so you get a little sprinkling of all the work that i've done in that period of time uh being an illustrator uh being a graphic designer i had a couple of different looks to my work and that became a problem in the beginning because people had a hard time tracking me you know he's got some artists that do one style their whole career and then here's this guy doing multiple styles it was this he craved for my collectors to keep up for a while I think after a while, they began to know what to expect from my work. And uh, as a matter of fact, I think that was something that I think intrigued my customers, is that I could have a, a different, different look of all of the pieces that I try to do. Yeah, well, but you went from, you went culturally on everybody. You dug really deep into your community. Um, and what, what made that happen? I went to a white art school. That's what made that happen. <laughs> okay. I was a minority in a white art school, one of the top five art schools in the country. I lucked up and got a scholarship to that school, the Maryland Institute College of Art. And um, yeah, so at, when I first got there, I felt like I was being alienated because of all of the things I brought with me with my work. And it took me a long time to understand what that chapter was supposed to represent. I get into that in the book and really explain it what my background was and how I tried to adjust to those things. Uh, but I've, I've been my whole life, man. When I say black, I'm not talking about color. I'm talking about my whole mentality. I've always been pro-black. I've always been into watching us engage ourselves and, and uh, to enrich ourselves. I think as a visual, as, a, as an image maker, that's one of our responsibilities. As an artist, that's one of our responsibilities. So where I can do just about any kind of image and was doing multiple uh, types of images in my graphic design and, and illustration career, I decided, nah, man, I want to do something that, that speaks to my people. Yeah. And so I, once I turned that corner, I never looked back. I, I got that, brother. I, um, I had a similar sort of uh, story in my life where, you know, I got... Uh, when I decided to become a photographer, I went to one of the better schools in the country, which was Art Center College of Design. And there you were, you know, there's five black people in the whole school. I mean, it's like, 
you know, and you're being tossed into this thing. And then you got to fight against that and say, oh, no, <laughs> I ain't going there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's inevitable. I mean, I'm sure other people that do other trades, other crafts, other interests go through the same thing. It's, it's even uh, it's more it's, it's more evident in arts. I mean, arts is uh, we don't talk about race too much in the arts. Arts is so divisive. You know, they got so many things that we have the, all these traditional artists, all of these masters that we've had to hear about our whole careers um, and that are held in high esteem. And it took me past college years to, to really learn who the black artists were. You know, I didn't know who uh, uh, Romeo Bearden was when I was in college. And that's a shame. Uh, yeah. Was a old man and not know about Romeo Bearden in an art school. But that's just how how bad it was, you know. Uh, that shows you how bad my high school education was too, when it came to that type of exposure. And so here I was at this art school undergrad. I got a bachelor's degree, but after I graduated, I really started looking into well, who are all of these people? You know, I, I joined up with the National Conference of Artists, met Frank Frazier and Bing Davis and some other people. And after a while, I started, oh, that's that's where our people are. They're in these uh, HBCUs. They're in this this whole different circuit. They're not in the history books yet. So, but I started to really embrace and search out who those artists was, and and found out about Charles White and fell in love. Yeah, yeah, I, I read that in your book where you uh, found out about him uh, through I think through uh, your one of your teachers. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, in in doing that, um, I wanted to ask you: Have you ever lived in another city? Have no, you actually, I've not, I've not lived in another city. I've been in Baltimore. I was born and raised in Baltimore. But Baltimore is my home base. Um, it's 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 prepared me for everything that I am as an artist. <laughs> if, you, if you can survive in Baltimore. You can survive anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but what I love about Baltimore is it's centrally located, man. I could be in D.C. in 35 minutes, Philly in two hours, New York in three hours, Delaware in one hour, you know, uh, Virginia in two and a half hours. It's just, it's uh, it's close to everything. And yeah, uh, so and I'm sure you get that influence from the south and from the north also. I mean, you got that. Actually, we are the northernmost southern state. Okay. Which people here country don't know the country. <laughs> but being in Baltimore and being with so many different types of vibes you can be in within an hour or two, I think is an influence in my work too. I've always been quite comfortable uh, here in Baltimore. That's why I make it my home base. I've had opportunities to live in other cities quite a few times in my career. But ultimately, I decided to stay here because of the cost of living um the attitude in baltimore has has uh it, it's 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 like if you're if people either like you or they don't like you in baltimore <laughs> it's that simple but with that they either care or don't care about you oh, you know okay. and so it leaves a lot of room for anonymity <laughs> Because most people don't care what you're doing. So I feel very, very comfortable here. I can, uh, you know, people don't bother me. I don't bother them. The art scene in Baltimore has always struggled. And to this day, despite the success I've had as an artist, I still have those same struggles regionally in Baltimore. But I've always been a traveler. I filled up uh, four passports working on my fifth one. So, you know, travel has always been one of the most important parts of my being. Yeah. Okay. It's being able to get away and go somewhere. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. When when the when the road shows started happening, when the exhibitions and the uh, festivals and the uh, all these these different types of venues to exhibit, show, and share, uh, it was magical for a brother from Baltimore. I mean, so I was loaded up my truck and I was driving, you know, 12, 14, 16, 20 hours out. And could be in a whole different vibe in a whole different city and so that appeal was wonderful for me when i first started in the early 80s of course it's not so appealing to me now <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
so 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 then about the 90s when the uh baltimore had a fine arts exhibit that they were putting on too a black art fine arts absolutely exhibit. we had one here called the black heritage art show that was done by glenda boone and she worked very very hard to make sure that baltimore had a show because uh, we had a show in philly we had one in uh cincinnati we had one in los angeles we had one in atlanta so she wanted to make sure she one in chicago they were actually we had some in, in every quarter but she wanted to make sure that baltimore was well represented and she did a very good job of that for um over a decade and a half yeah i think that's when i got my first uh larry poncho brown brown piece was at one of those shows in the, mm -hmm. in the 90s in baltimore um so well, and again the, the, that that whole thing that whole era that that time frame that 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 backdrop is really what my book is about i mean my book is not an autobiography by any stretch of the imagination uh i would need uh uh i would need to put a brown wrapper on my real life <laughs> <laughs> but what i tried to do was to give artists my collectors and people an idea of the journey the artistic journey, the creative journey as an artist, the things I had to go through to navigate through this thing to be able to do what I'm doing today. And I've had to fight very hard to stay in the lane that I wanted to stay in. I had to choose which gang I wanted to be associated with. I had to figure out how I was going to navigate through this thing where I could sustain myself. And um, as I say that, I've had plenty of ups and downs. It's a peak and valley life. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but, uh, yeah. overall uh, i wanted to make sure i was able to tell my story because um it's very difficult to leave a legacy when you don't mm. say that again my brother it's very difficult to leave a legacy when you don't tell your story yeah it's hard for somebody to know what what happened right you know i'm letting see the thing is you're only relevant when you're on people's tongue <laughs> You know, when, when you drop off of people's tongue, you're forgotten. I'm looking at artists like Albert Fennell, looking at uh, people who haven't been gone for uh, 20 years yet. I'm looking at Annie Lee. Uh, I can give you a list of artists who have completely fallen off the tongues of people despite this digital age where we see documentaries of people that were 30 years ago. Now, I'm not saying that, that won't change, but that just shows you just how vulnerable telling our story is. I mean, what's exciting now when I look at media is we're beginning to see the stories of so many different things. Lots of really nice documentaries are out. Uh, and But I wanted to really try to set a precedent. You know me, man. I've always tried to have my finger and my pulse on what was going to be happening in our industry next. And when I say our industry, I'm talking about African-American artists, actual, actual African-American visionaries, vi uh, image makers, wearable artists. I always wanted to kind of feel what was the next change and so um this next phase is going to be about using media of course you know through your show i have a show too uh we're able to take advantage of many things now but we're also uh walking away from some of the things that have always documented our history and writing is one of them <laughs> that's true so uh no i i sat down uh, i started writing uh i started recording into a recorder and I started having that transcribed and I started getting all these pages back and, and suddenly because I didn't look at myself as a, as a writer. But I also remember when I was in the Maryland Institute, they put me in English 101. <laughs> now, here's a kid who's good in school his whole life, didn't have to study, uh, got accepted at MICA. And they say, well, we're going to put you at English 101 because your academic scores came up kind of low. And so I was kind of pissed off. I was kind of like, well, what y'all trying to say? So what happened was I decided to just fight it out. They put me in English 101. And what happened was they put me in a class with all foreign students who were learning English as a second, third language. So they didn't even know what my circumstance was. <laughs> as long as I kept my mouth shut. <laughs> so, but that changed my world. It changed my world but in that class i found out that i had a knack for writing the teacher actually took time made some footnotes and told me right away hey you have a knack for writing you need to explore that more but i never did oh. I, kept, I kept journals 
uh, but I never did pursue that uh, or, and then look back at that. So this is my first time really be visiting that whole concept uh, as I was preparing to write this book. Well, I'm sure that's going to happen again because you've got some time to do it one more time. Let us know a little bit more, more about uh, Larry Poncho Brown. So, so look, I want to go back to another thing about the book uh, that I've gone through. And uh, like I said, I went from that period of, of you in the 80s to where you went into the 90s, where you started doing the, uh, you know, you got more involved with the culture, you know, and you sort of stuck with the culture. And you've always elevated or tried to elevate women to, you know, royalty. I mean, you, you see them as such. Yeah, they were, my, they were my early heroes in many of my works, you know. Yeah. And uh, so that's always been. And the many of those, uh, especially the, the, the fantasy work, were actually friends that model for me. I used their heads on somebody else's body. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I went through a whole evolution trying to learn how to do different things. Um, but I, I think the main part of my story is that I tried to also explain the nuances of the art business because a lot of people don't really understand uh, how the art business is structured. And uh, I'm a commercially successful artist, which means that when I'm on that bandwagon, there's a lot of things I can't partake in. You know, there's uh, the fine art establishment and then there's a the commercial market. And they're, and, and they're two different philosophies, two different gangs. You either part of one or not. I know a very few artists I could probably count them on one hand that are alive today that have been able to work on both sides of it. I am not one of those artists. So I've had to do a lot of different things. And so, and I've also had to go outside of the box. And that's why I realized that going outside of the box is not even what you're doing. After a while, you're getting rid of the box and you're creating your, your path just like you would create your work. And so I've always used that with my marketing. I've always used that. Well, what am I going to do next? And why am I doing this? Um, the book for me was a chance to reconnect with my followers and my collectors who are, my work is in about 500,000 homes. I was like, well, why, what would happen if, even if they're not buying any art anymore, if they could see one of the works on their walls in this book. And that's, yeah. that's where I started. I, I wanted to leave a legacy piece. I was like, again, I was diagnosed with cancer six years ago. You and I have, uh, a lot of people don't know that me and Lavalle have, uh, have a, uh, we're, we're brothers in a lot of ways. He's been very yeah, supportive yeah. of me in my, in my battle. I've been very part of him and his. But that changed my perspective because I stopped thinking about long term, started thinking more about short term, and I realized I didn't have really anything that was pointing towards legacy. And there was a possibility I could end up like some of those artists I mentioned earlier. And the fastest way I figured to do that was the film was one, but that was real painstaking. We started that in 2018. And now I understand why it takes so long to do a film. <laughs> but we started this book uh, in 20, uh, I would say 2019. The book was pretty well designed until um, I put up a crowdfunding campaign. See, crowdfunding is another thing that I want to talk about because you can now finance whatever project you want to do with the people who follow you. If you haven't looked at that, I've talked about Kickstarter, Indiegogo, Check them out. You know, it's been sitting there. I've been dabbling with it for the last decade or two, and it's been very uh, fruitful for me. So once we got the book designed, I decided to put up a crowdfunding campaign, and I was going to try to do it for ten thousand dollars. See if I could. I think I could raise ten thousand, and possibly I will put ten thousand towards it. Right? Put that campaign up, man. We raised ten thousand dollars in, in in like less than a couple of weeks. Next thing, when it to, it went to twenty thousand dollars. Next thing you know, one up to thirty thousand dollars, and almost from other sources, we got close to forty thousand dollars. So, people, uh, when you talk about being commercially successful, the question I had to ask myself was, why was I waiting for someone to validate my story? Who was going to write that story? Who was going to say that Poncho was important enough? to even uh, uh, put attention on. And I'm so many other artists in that same situation. So what I decided to do was, okay, well, I'm not trying to compete with that, but what I do know is that my following will work for me. When we raised that money, it changed everything. Because where we were in designing the book, we had to go back. At that point, we raised so much more money than I expected 
that it gave me a chance to um, make the book bigger, um, have more pages, uh, go from softbound to hardbound. Uh, but while that was happening, so was COVID. And so I was running into supply chain issues. I was running into quality issues. I, I, many printers retired. Uh, many of the people that were in the plants were, uh, you know, were, were displaced during the COVID. So I ran into a situation where uh, the uh, and inflation also was an issue. So the cost of the book we did le- uh, a couple of years ago doubled. Right. And so I couldn't really. And then not only did it double, but the people told me that they couldn't match the quality of the last book I did. And so over the last 20 years, myself and Charles Bibbs and a couple of the artists who've been murmuring about doing books, we've also murmured about printing outside the country, Mexico, China, uh, which we all frowned on at one point because we know how the laws and regulations are different in every country. Uh, but I finally had to sit down and talk to myself to get past this hurdle of the supply chain issue and all the things that I was facing with this book, having already collected that money from my followers. And so luckily I talked to an artist who uh, gave me the name of a printer that um, was a broker out of Seattle and they uh, sent me samples. And and when they sent me samples, the one of the books they sent me was Afrocobra. Yeah. I just went to the exhibition about two years ago in Miami. Their book wasn't done yet, but the company that printed the book sent me that as a sample. And see, oh, okay. it's, it was in divine order. I found a good printer. Um, it was very fruitful work for them. They were very professional. They met every time, um, every, every, everything we scheduled, they met. And, uh, and they did a top-notch book. And the thing I like about this company is that they um, specialize in doing reference books and specifically books for museums. Yeah, well, your book is going to make a lot of coffee tables. I've already talked to some people that say they really, they, they, <laughs> it's their coffee table book. They well, that was, that was part of the plan. I wanted, number one, I wanted it to be able to compete against any museum book, any museum bookstore book. I wanted it to be able to be thrown down next to a Picasso book. And you go, okay, it, it, it fits. But I also wanted, I wanted the quality to be there. And so uh, once I got past that hurdle, um, now that we've begun to fulfill the orders of the people who backed this project, which is over 250 people who backed this project, and I listed each one of their names in my book in the acknowledgement section because they were actually my publishers. Yeah, yeah, I was one of them. I started out really early. Exactly, exactly. Well, of course. And so everybody that was in that list got their books uh, autographed. Um, I, but And then I started sending them out. And I did this little uh, card that had tell people to take a picture and and hashtag punch for retrospective. So now every other day, there's a picture popping up on the internet somewhere of people holding the book. So they're actually helped me with my next tier of marketing. So it's it's been really exciting. It's me sitting down, figuring another way to do it. It's me not waiting for somebody to validate me. It's me looking down the road to figure out how I want to navigate this stage of my career. And I'm, I'm laying a challenge down to other artists to do the same thing. I'm not sitting here like I'm the first person to do a book. I must tell you that uh, my brother, Leroy Campbell, when I first saw his book, and this is about two years ago, he was the one that really made me go, mm. now trust me, I have, I have a whole collection of books. But when I saw his book, it was personal, it was about his life. Um, and I just kept saying, man, I just need to sit down and, and focus on this. Mm. But not only that, our market needs to do it, you know. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm hoping to inspire other artists to sit down and write their story and tell their story. Very important. So uh, Robin wants to know, if this, how does she get your book? Uh, you can go to LarryPontoBrown.net. Larry Poncho Brown, not now on the first page. Boom, you'll see the book right there. You got three options you can do to, to buy the book. Um, I got my first book uh, book signing scheduled for tomorrow. So right after we get to this, I'll be preparing for that. Um, so yeah, it, it's I got three um, three book signings in the DMV, which is the District of Columbia, Maryland, Virginia area. And then I'm going to start doing my national tour from there. 
Oh, you're gonna do a national tour, so you gotta be whoever whoever says, Hey, we want to do a book sign, and I'm there. All right. <laughs> and because you just say, Hey, are you gonna put it on Amazon? No, I what would I give Jeff Bezos my money for? For what? If I got people out there that are sensitized to what I'm trying to do, and I'm not trying to take all the money either. But I'll probably post it on Amazon and have three of them available. <laughs> and you can go to my website and get them. But I'm always thinking of ways to keep it in my community. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 very important. It's to keep the money at home, that's for sure. Well, um, I mean, but well, also, I also love it that you, you know, that you, you, you continue to do your gift giving thing too. I was, uh, I was very happy with my, uh, uh, I, I just got a new refrigerator, so I was able to throw some uh, magnets. I, 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 throw some magnets are you talking about our package. sticker yeah. magnet package? Oh, man. I was like, oh, I'm in heaven now. I, I got it. Well, you, see all, you, see all those, you, you see all those boxes stacked up behind <laughs> me. Those are book boxes. <laughs> We've been rolling. from uh, The books were delivered on June the 23rd, the day after my son's birthday. And we have been painstakingly putting them in the mail at least 20 to 30 a day to the point where we have delivered over 400 books. That's great, my brother. Look, let me, let me I got one other question to ask you about, sure. um, about a part in your, uh, in your book where uh, what I see happening, and, and that's the use of black, total black. You, you, do you do you start with the black and then you add the color to everything that happens, or is it the reverse of that? Um, <laughs> uh, for all the people that want to soundbite me, I hate all things white. <laughs> <laughs> so ninety percent of my paintings start black. <laughs> If I'm yeah. doing watercolor, that's the only exception, you know. <laughs> but I really like working from a black background. The colors vibrate more. I, I'm a technician when it comes to using color. So, so how did that happen? Because that don't just happen to you. You don't just you don't just go there. That that's something that you got to be able to see. I I, I noticed that. Well, I mean, come on, man. You remember back in the day? You remember them vel them um, velour and them velvet paintings that came out in the seventies? You seen it? You don't remember those black light posters they was doing back in the day with fluorescent on black? So we've seen it before. We may not have incorporated. So for me, it was natural to try oh, okay. doing something on black. Oh, okay, that was a good influence. I, I remember that era very, Absolutely. very. Early. I know you do. You got one in the closet right now, and you got a. You probably got a purple light bulb in in the closet. With you. <laughs> yeah, I get rid of my black light. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's that's some of the inspirations, man. You know, I'm I'm, I'm an image maker, man. So I'm a sponge. I, I take these things, and I never know how they're going to come out on paper. Yeah. Okay, and and we also have a question about some of the earlier work with the fantasies and stuff. Is that stuff still available? Can you still purchase? Um, there might be three that you can still get on uh, in my website uh, at uh, uh, because. Uh, as most people who have been following me know, I had a studio, a major studio fire in 1995, where I lost everything I created up to 1995. So the, another backstory to the book is that I had to really research pieces that were destroyed in the fire. And so I had to go back to collectors. I had to find out the best technology I could use to replicate an image from a poster or a print. It was a real process to see uh, what technology was available for me to recreate these images because I didn't know how they were all look. You know how you look at a documentary and you see the crisp new film and then they put like that old thing from 1980. I didn't want my book to look like that. So I had to go through a couple of processes and learned a lot of things on how to make it balance out a little better. So yeah, that was a big issue. Like most of the pieces that at the beginning of the book were actually because my mother had them when she passed. And I didn't know she had them after after I had the fire, and I reclaimed them after she passed. So the first, the first uh, couple pages, all those pieces were in my mother's personal collection. 
Oh, okay. So, and, and, and some of those may be available as a print or something. No, the pieces in the very beginning of the book, the first few pages from the 1980s are not available in print. Uh, some of the space women, uh, the robots, those were, you might, there might be about three of those that are still available in G clay form. Uh, but a lot of the earlier works are not available anymore. And then, you know, you have limited editions. Some of them are sold out. A lot of those originals are sold. So, uh, the book just gives you an overview of what has been created and what's been put on the print market uh, but if you're looking to see if you want to acquire any of those pieces just go to the website put that title in the search window it'll tell you uh, right away what the status is on any of those pieces and what's the price of the book the book is 60 dollars. all right but on my website you've got three tiers you can order the book 60 dollars is base 80 dollars if you want to sign autographed and it's a hundred dollars if you want it remarked. All right. So, and trust me, people are buying a lot of remarks, which means I got to sit down and do a small original drawing on the on the front of each one of those uh, books. <laughs> can, can you see our? Uh, do you see our, our our things on your screen right yes, now? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, our friend out in uh, Midland, Texas. Yeah, I know Miss Miss Fuller. Oh, okay. You know, yeah, Rob, wow. Yeah, I know Carol Joyce. You know, uh, I, people. I, I have loyal fans, man. They, they, they've been sticking with me for a long time. I haven't got caught up in a scandal yet. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, man, we ain't cancel culture. All I gotta do is one thing wrong, man, and I'm canceled for real. <laughs> No, brother. I believe your body of work stands for itself. I don't think that uh, I don't think there's ever going to be in the knocking you down because you really do have a, a large body of work. Um, well, you know, it's hard to satisfy everybody, and I think I, I I don't try I don't try to satisfy everybody. I try to be as authentic as I can. Um, I think that most of my collectors get me. I think that there's probably a few people out there that may have met me at the wrong opportunity and never got to really know me. Uh, I think one thing by broadcasting my show weekly is that people have developed a relationship with me that they couldn't have before. And so I think even all of the things that we use now to get our work out is helping to uh, you know, break down the, the barrier between me and a lot of my collectors. Nice. You know, most of them don't know I have a sense of humor that is hiding in my artwork somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, but they can appreciate your work, and that's that's even more important because they don't have to know you, you know, personally. But well, they, we're at a time they, now where it's they a get to know you through your work, though. But it's yeah. a different time now, man. When people invest in your work, they are investing in you. They are buying a piece of you. And yeah. so it always, um, I'm always conscious of how I react and interact with uh, my collectors. You know, um, I, I've always tried to be down to earth and approachable as I can because I'm really a loner. Most artists are. Um, but I think once they, they see authentic you are, uh, it does change the relationship. Even if they don't buy your work, they're going to kind of support what you're doing. But you know, the average household only holds about 15, 20 pieces. And well, but you have a lot of people outside of your collectors too who, who like your work, like I said. Uh, well, I mean, it's become a generation now, man. After 40 years, you're talking about two generations just in 40 years. But my work now is really appealing to three generations because you've got the people that were buying back in the 80s. Most of them have retired. Their children are inheriting their works, and there's a new market of people coming in now. And so, um, uh, again, the more I stay active, and relevant uh the broader my demographic will be all right so and uh i know recently you were off into africa you you have a new project going over in uh, is that ghana yeah um uh, ghana has been kind of a special place for me because um i've been doing trips to africa for the last decade or two i've gone to ghana maybe twice i've gone to senegal once but we've planted some seeds and met some people in ghana that are um really advocates of what we're trying to do and i say we i'm talking about me and my partner karen clark the sculptor you know so we do um the ceramicist 
we do uh we've been doing those trips for a while so uh of course i spent six weeks there in january got a chance to meet a group of artists i and adopted a studio of young artists i got to do some um some drawings and paintings of some of the students that are there so i got to do some goodwill while i was there using their work and so i'm going to be spending a little more time doing that i got a group i'm taking in october a group of, of 28 people and i'm taking back in october and I do plan to go back in January again, but I'm trying to entice two artist friends of mine to go with me. Kababi Bayak out of St. Louis, the muralist, and Charlie Palmer are interested in going with me in January. So I'm always, I want to introduce, because the arts are dying in Africa. Africa's going through a regression. And I won't get too deep into that right now, but what I will say is colonization has an effect on us. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you that black people in America are probably, and this is what I learned in January, black people in America are probably the blackest people on the planet. And mm -hmm. I say that not with an attitude. I say that because we have been striving from the time we got off the ship to find our identity and reconnect to our identity. We've had to fight for everything we got to this point, whether we're winning, losing or whatever, the strongest of the strong are the people who survived when they got to this country. Two million of us died in the war to try to get here. And so there's a blackness, there's an innateness in us that we don't appreciate. But what's happening in Africa is they're moving backwards. Um, religion, Christianity has its own stakehold. Um, they are they're, they're relinquishing the arts. They don't believe in tradition as much as they used to. They're scared of their own uh, African sculptures and artifacts they think is voodoo mm. because of the influence of Christianity and other religions. And so uh, when I worked, adopted my group of artists that ranged from 30, uh, I think 34 down to 17, I adopted them for that reason to try to see if I could save them from abandoning what they're doing they're, they're trying to be artists and survivors artists so i figured why not lend a hand in trying to help that generation turn some of the things around that's happening in their own community and so um you know it's just sharing what i do here um I've, I've i've been a mentor to artists my whole life it's been part of what i do but i'm appreciated more in africa than i'm appreciated here because people feel entitled to my support here they feel entitled to my mentorship here they don't feel that way in Africa. Oh, okay. Get a big, bigger appreciation of what it Absolutely. is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's because you've been a Baltimore native all your life. And no, I don't have to do Baltimore. When I, when I talk to you, I'm not a regional thinker. I've never been a regional thinker. I'm talking about the reflections of what I've seen as I travel this country. My mentorship is not about Baltimore. My mentorship is about uh, the United States. I have mentors, mentor, mentees in every every part of this country, you know, and I get to feel what's happening, the things that they're going through. There's a common thread that happens with creators. And so I'm speaking a language and speaking to them in a way they can understand and it allows me to demystify some of the struggles that they're going through. And so um, I don't, I, if, if I waited for Baltimore support, I would have died a long time ago. You know, I don't I don't wait for support from people. I just stick to the agenda that I think the creator set for me to do. And um, and I keep it simple. I just do it. I get out of the way and I do it and I share it and let it do what it's supposed to do. That, that's you. <laughs> yeah. All right, my brother. So um, anybody else got any questions for uh, Brother Poncho before we get out of here? We don't want to you know keep you all night long i know you got got something to go do um, well you know uh, uh, this is where i am uh at least uh, for 12 to 14 hours a day uh i i have a little pathway that i can walk through this space right now <laughs> i tell you it's funny man when we got these books i ordered two thousand books and i did not expect what that looked like coming off of a truck or off of a ship seven pallets of books wow but we've uh cleared off two pallets already oh okay 
at least you got a big enough studio there. You can hold them. Oh, with no trust and believe. I don't. I have other space in this building where I can do that. You know, you just gotta, you just gotta ask for help. Cause <laughs> I don't know what I expected to see, but it was like it was kind of a long, quiet twenty minutes of ponderance. <laughs> I, I'm glad I've talked to a couple of people who've also, also received their book, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> and they're very happy. Uh, they're very happy with their book. They're very, I mean, like I said, the quality of your book is just outstanding. So uh, if you got a book that you need to put there on, on your coffee table or with your other art books, have Mr. Larry Puncho Brown's book on with your little collection. Okay, everybody. That's um, right. Add it, add it to your collection, and you you will be very, very happy. There's there's lots of great work. Uh, you can see uh, the you can see a lot about this young man too with uh, his colors. What his I like color. about it too, uh, Lovely, is this is in chronological order, so you get to see the path I took creatively, what may have inspired me through that direction, and towards the end of the book, you see commissions that I did for other organizations, about 70 or so pieces in the back of the book. They show you pieces that were done for other organizations. So you get to see a good cross section of my commercial work, but you also get to see a good cross section of the commission work that I've done over the years. Um, I, I couldn't, um, you know, it's, it's, it was emotional for my family to receive that book. And uh, to me, that, that meant more than anything that could happen. I understand that. <laughs> you know, that, 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 uh, that that fueled me yeah that, that fulfills everything because yeah, you know i was sitting down wondering when i got him back man i just wish my mom and my dad could see that book <laughs> and my, especially my dad you know because my dad is still out that book i mean my dad a lot of my dad's uh work that he left behind i, I sometimes paint on his background so you see some of the, the flavor of what he taught me is in that book well, well, that must have been a very good experience, man. I mean, don't, don't too many people get a chance to grow up in a creative environment. And even though your dad's creativity was with print, printing, that, that, that in itself was an art because people had to use that and came to that if you were, if you were trying to recreate anything that you were doing. You ultimately had to go to the printer in order to get it and you know, make it happen. Well, yeah. but the thing is so cool is that if you get a chance to really delve into some of the pages of the book is that my father was a teenage parent. And so he had to leave art to do printing. My, my dad also didn't have any outlets to sell his work. And I think my dad never wanted me to go through that frustration. So he was trying to trick me away from art. And so uh, the, the beginning of my developmental years, and we talk about that in the book, I had other people step in and try to guide my path. But uh, later on in my career, uh, my dad was my biggest fan, you know? So you got to leave room for folks to do whatever transition they're going to do. But you also got to be serious about what you're doing and, and change the paradigm of what their fears may be. And I did that for my father. I picked up the baton and I did a lot of things he would never be able to do. And I got a chance to prove many people wrong in my journey as an artist to do this as a living and so i didn't uh i didn't have to be obnoxious to do it but there was a strategy involved and the book really does explain to you how i went about doing that yeah it's it's all there laid out for everybody so all you got to do is come on go to larryponchobrown.net and you'll find the book get your purchase make sure you have the book that's right, y'all. Get the book. Get the book. It is It is really nice. Uh, shout out to my design team, Joe Ford and Donna Gardner. Um, they really knocked it out of the park, man. Uh, when Donna Gardner saw the book, and she designed the book. <laughs> she teared up. <laughs> you no, know, it's been amazing to me to see, the, hear the emotional aspect of what some people felt. My buddy Ricky, who I grew up with, my the draw from my buddy Ricky. And I mentioned him in the book. And our short story of how he really motivated me to stay in the arts, more so than my father at that particular time. And mm -hmm. so it was nice for me to 
able to give a shout to the people who were there in the dark that nobody knows about. Everybody thinks that Poncho's success was about Poncho. No, Poncho's success was about a lot of people that took the time and um, and a lot of people that didn't <laughs> because if you didn't help me, you still helped me. You helped me be determined to find another answer. Yeah. And so the book really tells the people who were uh, really vital to my success. All right. So look, um, with that, we're going to go ahead on and end our show tonight. I, I know we could hang out for a long time, but we're going to keep it. We're going to keep it nice. And I gotta go out. And, I gotta go help Ella fix her flat. Yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't expect to keep you this long anyway, but I'm glad. Oh uh, no, man, this is no problem, brother. We we no, just I, talking, man. We just talking. Now, you know, I appreciate yeah. what you're doing, man. You're like, you're like my, my 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 brother from another mother, and especially in this this environment that we're trying to exploit and explore so i appreciate you taking the time man uh same here my brother thank you very 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 much for being on the show and uh, we look forward to seeing you and, and talking to you again so everybody like i said go out and get your book i got mine make sure you get yours all right that's right thank you very much lovely all right my brother y'all take care it. all right all right everybody so um I think that's going to do it for this afternoon. Uh, Ella and I were planning on showing a couple of pieces, but I think we've had a very nice evening talking with uh, Pancho and uh, to Lavanda. I just want to say, I don't know how you miss Mr. Pancho Brown either, but for all you guys that are watching the show, please go check out Pancho's website or, or you know, uh, look at somebody just put his name up and you'll you'll be, you'll you'll be impressed with what you'll find uh, i have some of his work in every room the big picture behind me is one of his pictures and uh, i've been like i said I, I started with my first piece of his uh back in the 90s and i've continued to uh adorn my house with his work and i love his work and really appreciate him coming on the show and sharing with you uh now you can all share uh, a lot of his work by purchasing his book because there's quite a bit of his work in the book all right so with that i'm going to go ahead on and say good night to everyone if somebody unless somebody got something to say to me before we leave uh, i'm looking forward to seeing you next week it was great to have to see you this week uh i don't know if ella will be back by next week but uh she will be back very soon also <laughs> yeah that's true uh a lot of the times that's the whole story you know we're looking at his work and you don't know the artist but uh check him out all right and greetings to dallas to to radiant sunshine and her and her mom for peeking in today. I know it's hot in Dallas because it's also hot over there in Midland. Uh, and uh, my friend who's in Colleen, I know it's hot over there for Floyd. <laughs> so, uh, so everybody stay cool. See you next week. All right, I'm gonna say good night. All right, good night, everybody. See you later.